Creep Geeks Podcast is an offbeat news podcast that takes a light-hearted approach to the paranormal, supernatural, cryptid, strange, the silly, and trending tech topics circulating the web. We broadcast weekly paranormal news and fun stories from our underground bunker in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Be sure to follow for more. Hello, it begins again. Welcome back to Creep Geeks Podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we're your hosts. Yeah. You're supposed to okay. be more enthusiastical. I think I'm going to have to ban you from words with friends. That's fine. Okay. So anyway, welcome back to Creep Geeks Podcast. This is our episode number 198. Ouija board info, Alistair Crowley's box, Tom DeLong TTSA debunked and SpaceX success. Yes. Okay. So anyway, with this particular podcast that we have right here, if this is your very first time tuning in, we talk about stuff that we find to be interesting on the internet. Usually paranormal, a little bit of ghost, a little bit of UFO, a little technology, stuff like that. And primarily it's because that's what we like. That's our thing. We yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. And we also go out and hunt ghosts and all that good stuff. Bigfoots. Is that plural? <laughs> ghosts. Weird phenomenons. Okay. Every time I hear that when somebody gets phenomenon, I think do 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 <laughs> phenomenon do 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 do. So anyway, with this particular episode, we have a lot of stuff we're going to talk about, and it's pretty cool. Pretty cool to have you back. If this is your very first time listening, though, we do welcome you. Yeah. To our podcast. So let's just kind of get right into it. So here's the deal: if you have something you'd like to share with us, we do have a phone number for you to call in, and you can leave us a voicemail message. And that phone number is going to be five seven five two zero eight. Four zero two five. Fun fact, that's a Roswell area code. Yeah. Just in case you're wondering. We do also have a website. Creepgeeks.com. Where you can contact us with our contact form if you'd like to do it that way. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about some stuff that we found to be interesting, right? Sure. Okay. So Ouija boards. Okay. Love them. Hate them. I'm interested in them. But that I'm, wasn't a choice. But I'm also a little wary of them. Yeah. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the Ouija boards. Okay. And the reason being is, is because there's rules, right? Yeah. And evidently, <clears throat> these rules, if not uh, properly followed, could be uh, problematic, and everybody's got scary stories and, uh, you know, things to talk about when it comes to Ouija boards. And there's some people who will not even allow them in their house or go near them. Yes. And, um, what, <clears throat> you know, we all have experiences, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Everybody plays with them. They're considered to be up for a long time, children's toy, spirit board, whatever you want to call it. Did you ever? What? Use one? Yeah, we had lights flipping around and the chandelier was moving and somebody left and almost got hit by a car. It was like this weird thing. I, that I really, sounds like a TV show. <laughs> it, really well, it wasn't, does. but I mean, that's kind of what happened. You know, questions were asked, power got flickered. Now, in, you know, in hindsight, I have no idea because I think we were like 12, something yeah. dumb like that, you know. I have no idea if that was the Ouija board doing it or somebody goofing around, but honestly, we were the only ones in the house. We were all in one spot, and everybody was in sight of each other, so all the weirdness that occurred, I don't know who would have done it. Okay. But, you know, I wasn't actively someone who was taking part of it. I was just happened to be there. I was an audience member. Oh, okay. Um, But, I mean, even so, I didn't, I didn't particularly care for it. I just... The Ouija board itself was just weird. Yeah. You know, and I don't remember much about it. Um, you know, like it wasn't like this, you know, Ouija board from the 1800s and all. It wasn't, it was just like a regular old, like, I think Parker Brothers so, yeah. Ouija board with a plastic planchette thing and all yeah. that stuff. But, you know, it, looking back on it now and being, I mean, okay, so most things you can use to contact the other side to summon to to speak to spirits and that kind of thing you don't have to actually have a Ouija board yeah but I guess it makes it easier right it has a little format so I mean these things came out like 130 years ago oh wow probably even longer but okay so with with like every story when it comes to Ouija boards you do it wrong bad stuff happens okay right mm-hmm so I was cruising around the internet and I found this website called cult of weird.com. Yeah. And they have a thing that says basically Ouija board rules stay safe while talking to the spirits. Okay. So 
I read them, and they make sense to me. And they seem pretty on point for, you know, the basics of Ouija board rules, right, or spirit board communication. Yeah. So let's talk about them real quick. These are the rules that you should probably follow. Sure. Rule number one, never use the Ouija board alone. Now, some people are going to go, it's Ouija or something (laughs) like that. He's saying Ouija. It's Ouija. Whatever, man. So you do you. the reason, though, for this one is where, I guess, urban legend or how I grew up uh, learning about Ouija boards kind of differs. It's Ouija. What? Okay. <laughs> so playing Ouija board by yourself leaves you more vulnerable to an evil spirit coming through from the other side. So always make sure you play with one or more of your friends. I was always told you have to play with more than one person because the spirits need all y'all's energy to communicate. So it would make no sense to play by yourself because you don't have enough power to help. Well, I think that's just probably some general dipshittery because I think really what it is, is that if you just have one person doing it, who's to say what, Um, at least with two people, you can do the whole, I'm not doing that. Are you doing that? And then everybody can freak out. I don't know, but it does make sense not to use it alone because you know, you're alone. It's buddy system. Okay. Right. Never play with the Ouija board in a graveyard. That seems obvious, though. Well, you would think. Yeah. Using a Ouija board in a graveyard or somewhere where a violent murder took place can cause a malevolent entity to come through and be evil. So here's the thing. A graveyard... Or the veil. Yeah. There's, there's another aspect to that, though. And the fact is graveyards are supposed to be sacred spaces. No yes. matter what your tradition or your background, a graveyard or where people are buried is considered a sacred space. And it's supposed to be consecrated ground. Yeah, consecrated ground, <clears throat> So, which translates to, to sacred. So why would you open a portal, which has, you know, I, I guess certain things attached to that concept, in some place that's already deemed sacred or a consecrated ground? Because. That's, that's just bad manners. Yeah, but we're talking about Ouija boards yeah. here. Well, where people do them wrong and they don't think about it. That's the thing. A Ouija board, in some extent, can be construed as a portal or method of communication. Yeah, but I, so. that's what I'm saying is I don't think people are looking at it that way. Okay. You know? I mean, it seems like the more you research this kind of thing, the more you know. Mm-hmm. And the more you're like, hmm, that makes sense. Let's not do that. But you have other people that don't know, and they think it's not real. They think it's a joke. Whatever. They don't, they don't give it respect that it probably deserves, and bad stuff can happen. Yeah. And, you know, some people would think, well, that's the perfect place to actually use a Ouija board would be, you know, in a cemetery where there's a bunch of dead people. You want to talk to spirits? Well, there they are. They're all right there. (laughs) Right? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Number three, never burn the Ouija board. It's said to be, it's basically, this is what I thought was funny. A Ouija board is said to scream when you try to burn it. And anyone who hears the board scream will have 36 hours to live. (laughs) Okay. I've never heard that before. I've, I've heard that the board scream. I just didn't hear that other... I've never heard that other part. That's what I mean. 36 hours to live. Yeah. Never heard that before. So I'm sure somebody out there has burned one of these things and is still around to tell us the story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it says, uh, burning a Ouija board doesn't work anyway, according to the stories, as it always seems to end up back in the owner's home intact. Okay. Uh, the proper way, if you're wondering, according to this, to dispose of a Ouija board is to break it into seven pieces sprinkle it with holy water, and bury it. Oh. It's almost like, I don't know. You know, it, this reminds me of this, the show Supernatural. Yeah. It's like cutting seven pieces, bury it in every direction of the compass, and sprinkle <laughs> salt on it. You know, some like made-up TV kind of you know so, way to, to do something. But I have a friend who had one, her and her sister. And uh, we we played with the Ouija board at a couple of sleepovers. But it caused so many problems for her older sister that her older sister did not do that. She ripped it in half and threw it into the ocean in the Outer Banks. That's how she got rid of it. Bam, 2020. <laughs> it took a while. Probably yeah. caused a hurricane. It pro- actually. <clears throat> or some kind of weird uh, well, she blamed anomaly. It. She blamed it on um, basically... Getting into a car accident and then basically losing our car and just some well, bad I time mean, at school. You know, that seems to you be know. the thing. If you don't get, you know, kilt 
or killed to death by a Ouija board is a series of bad misfortunate or was it a series of unfortunate events? You know, that kind of thing happens to you where just like one thing after another after another, right? Yeah. That's things would happen with cursed objects. Um, according to this, the game that named itself and then predicted the death of its creator, a brief history of the mystifying Ouija board. Hmm. That's a link you can click on if you want to go to the website. <laughs> For all the links that we have available for you on our website, because whenever we do a podcast and we talk about stuff like this, we have notes and things like that. We put them in the show notes and we put them on our website. Yeah. So we can go there and click and read along if you will. Yeah. I never knew this one. Um, Yeah, I did know this one. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Never leave the planchette on the Ouija board because if you leave it, it's opening up, you know, the ability for it to move around and do what it's got to do and escape. Oh, so having it on the board allows the spirit or, well, think about it. If if you're using the weed, the spirit board, yeah, or the Ouija board, right? Because it's probably trademarked Ouija board. I don't know. Um, and you have your hands on it, right? It's just moving around doing its own thing. So the spirits are channeling through you and your partner or whatever to make it speak. You have control of it to a certain degree, but if nobody has control of it, and if it's over letters or whatever, it can basically get out. I wonder if it's got to do like some special code and like unlock itself. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Like any of your password. And, yeah. You know, kind of. <laughs> um, but no, it says leaving the planchette or the pointer. If you don't know what a planchette is on the board can allow a demon or a spirit to escape from the board. Another way something can escape is if you allow the planchette to count down the numbers or the alphabet on the board. Oh, that's the release. So it has to go through the numbers. And once it gets to the end, it can get out. Oh, see, I had always heard if you let, <clears throat> there's always a question like, uh, you know, d- did you die? What's your name? If you allowed a demon to spell its name, you were basically allowing it to escape. I heard that one when I was younger. That sounds good. That's probably so movie fodder. Yeah, probably. So, uh, Number five, never ask when you will die. Yeah. And, and the person that wrote this says, I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's something you shouldn't really know or because the spirit will invent a terrible fate for you and then see to it that it comes true. Um, I don't know. I think you're if, if, with this, if you, it's almost like planting the seed of doubt hmm. or whatever. So maybe by asking when you'll die, if you get an answer of some sort, then you're just going to work your way to that end. Yeah. Whether it's subconsciously or not, you know. Yeah, it's almost like you're giving yourself. It's like saying, hey, man, don't fall off that curb. And then what do you do? You wind up falling off the curb. Yeah. It's like, Uh, what do they call it? Like fate? Like um, predetermined fate or something? Yeah, Yeah. it's like. Free will. I was going to say, yeah, well, I don't know. Predispositioned or whatever. Whatever. Predetermined. Whatever. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Always say goodbye. Yeah. Now, this is important. This is where I think everybody screws up. According to all the movies and everything else, closing the board is important because basically you're shutting the door, you're closing the portal, right? And so basically it says closing the board is important as it shuts the door to the other side and prevents lingering spirits from interfering in your life. Thank the spirits and say goodbye. The planchette should move down to the word goodbye on the board, and then you can safely put the board back in its box. Oh. If you don't close the session and it's still open, that's when you basically leave it open to chance for all this stuff to happen to you. And that that should be with all forms of communication. But this is the important part. If the spirit does not say goodbye back, then you need to say it once again. Oh. In other words, you need to make it understand. We're done. And then pass the planchette through the flame of a candle. Oh. So you burn that thread... You yeah. burn that open line of communication off. Right. You've ended it. Yeah. You've burned it. Like, it's done. Because if it doesn't want to give up, and it's not going to, it's not going to play by the rules, then the flame will purify and, and end it. See? Wow. Now, I don't know how you know accurate or true these rules are, but it makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, in the bottom of this article, it does talk about like one or two things that are variation of the rules that we sort of just talked about, such as never ask about God. Right? Yeah. You can place a silver coin on the board for protection. We did that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, some people say for protection. Some people say you, you're you basically putting, that, putting it there as an offering for the spirits to come. Like in exchange for their services, their information, their knowledge, you're going to pay them with some silver. Oh. 
you know. Um, and then also this one I, I've never heard before. It says never play the board when you're sick or weak, as it may make you vulnerable to possession and never play. If you think it's a game or you're an atheist or a doubter. In other words, if you don't have the proper respect for it and you don't believe in it, don't play the game. But see that that's not fair because I, well, am, it is fair. I'm always skeptical and I am a doubter. So that means I should never use this thing. Yeah, but you have a respect for it. True. People just don't, they think it's a joke, ha-ha, yucking it up, or whatever. They have no respect for it. So their intent is not to be respectful. Their intent is not there, and the intent is what binds everything. The intent behind you're doing what you're doing, and, you know, all of that stuff is, is important. That's like we've talked about in the past where, you know, people will go out in the woods or whatever, and they're intent on seeing a Bigfoot, and they may or may not see a Bigfoot. Once you put the intention out there in the universe, that's what draws things to you. Hmm. So if you if your intent is to be, you know, disrespectful, playing it off, not giving it the credence or the, or the seriousness that it deserves, you, you're going to be the first one. And see that disrespectful, that's that's the part where I think a lot of teenagers and a lot of young people, young adults even, that's where they fall victim to this whole yeah. thing. Yeah, and it kind of goes with atheists too. If you're typically an atheist, normally it means you have no faith. Mm-hmm. And you don't have faith in the things that could or should protect you. Because okay. I think the way it is, I'm not an atheist, but I would think the way it is, if you're an atheist and you don't believe in a higher power or, like, say, God, then you shouldn't believe in the devil. Hmm. Doesn't okay. that make sense? I mean, you can't have one without the other. But you could. Because <clears throat> it goes back to everything. There's equal and exact opposites for everything, light, dark, yin, yang, whatever. I mean, you I don't know. I guess there could be a thing like a moral atheist or an atheist who just may acknowledge ghosts but may not acknowledge God and the devil. Then I, they would be like part-time vegetarians. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, okay, so you believe in ghosts or UFO spirits, Bigfoot, but you don't believe in a higher unifi- higher unifying power. Maybe. Or an afterlife. I mean, because if you don't believe in a higher unifying power or afterlife, right? Because according to most atheists, when you die, you just your energy goes to the cosmos. Where, then how can you have a ghost? Because of things like uh, stone tape theory, echoes, residual energy. I mean, those well, have... I mean, then you'd have to totally acknowledge the, cap- or the possibility that if you do have ghosts and that sort of thing, then there probably is a higher power. Whether it's mono or monotheistic or not, I mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? That doesn't make sense to me. That's like saying, uh, I don't believe in the afterlife, but I believe in ghosts. No, there's a difference between not believing in the a higher power and okay. not believing in an afterlife or things like that. I kind of think you're just splitting the hairs at that point. Well, when it comes to atheists, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If you're an atheist, I think you're just splitting hairs. Okay. Well, getting back to like the whole um, disrespectful thing that I was talking about, like not acknowledging that this is a tool and kind of like with teenagers, I was going to talk about my experience uh, going over to a sleepover at a friend's house and it was me and three or four other people. And I guess this girl and her older sister, they found a Ouija board at a yard sale. They bought it. Didn't come with instructions. It was just the board and the planchette. Yeah. So we all started using it, and weird things were happening. Like we heard tapping on the stairs, and then it got higher and higher. But then we heard tapping in the crawl space because she, her bedroom was the room over the garage, mm-hmm. and all the houses were made in a certain way so that there was no way you could access the crawl space. That's when everybody got freaked out. The girl... She wasn't freaked out until that happened because what we didn't realize was her big sister was the one tapping on the stairs. You could go into the closet beneath the stairs and tap and make noise. Uh. So we were all like, man. So she tried to play it off. Maybe it was just something in the crawl space, like a squirrel or something. So we were like, that's messed up. Scared us. We didn't close the session. We were just very nonchalant, kind of spooked, but kind of angry for them for playing a trick on us. Well, within the next couple of weeks, her big sister got in a car wreck, had a bad time. Basically, I guess insurance didn't cover the car wreck. Mm. Yeah, parents grounded her, took her license away. She kind of 
wasn't doing good in school. So that's when she tore the thing in it's half. It's like karma. Yeah. Karma got her. She tore the thing in half and threw it in the in the ocean. <laughs> well, you know, you shouldn't be a, a, a spiritual butthole. Yeah. But it was like, you know, she didn't have proper respect. We did have some weird stuff happen. But you all never, the bad see, stuff happened to her. And that's the problem with all of this stuff. Yeah. You know, things happen. Is it because of what you're doing or is it just because it's going to happen anyway? Yeah. As no, you know, is it just coincidental or not? I don't know. But I thought the rules were kind of neat, and there were a couple in there that I'd never heard of before. You know, but I do like the fact that the way it kind of lays it out there and says, you know, always say goodbye, and then saying it again if it doesn't want to say goodbye, and then running the planchette through the flame. I don't remember that. Yeah. But it, it may have been how it always is. I don't know. Because when you bring up the Ouija board and you pulled it out of the box and there were no directions, that's like every Ouija board I've ever seen. Oh, this thing. Ever. Had, like no directions. You know? They bought it for like six bucks at a yard sale. Oh, yeah. No box, no instructions. It had tape on it. The, it had blood on the outside <laughs> of it. Like the, the planchette was taped to the side and like there was like playing cards stuck to it. It was oh, yeah. just. <laughs> it's like here's some. Here's some uh, Garage yeah. sale garbage for you. Pretty much, you know? So I thought it was cool because our parents never let us have one. So. Yep, that's how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> parents are smart. Kids do stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the, the actual Ouija board has, like, rules in the box. I don't know because I never bought one. And. I don't know. I'm not going to buy one to find out because there's better things to spend money on. Oh, okay. But I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I'm not. Because, <clears throat> I mean, honestly, I think if you're if you're opening the door for communication and you're trying to be somewhat serious with it, you don't probably necessarily need a Ouija board or Ouija board. Yeah. Um, but I do think a lot of it is locational, depending on where you are. I mean, a lot of times you only are c- cracking that thing out and playing with it because either you're being disrespectful in general or you're trying to get some information or maybe something weird's going on that makes you want to use the, bar- the board to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And see, I, yeah. I, I don't think they're as evil as everybody else says. I think kind of like how useful these rules are, I think they've just been used so improperly that they have a bad rep. Yeah. So, so, you know, going along with the Ouija board stuff, I came across Mysterious Universe is, is basically an article from uh, Paul Seaborn or mm-hmm. Byrne. I don't know why. Uh, every time I ever mention this man's name, I say Seaborn. I don't know. But anyway, Mr. Paul Seaborn had a little article here, and I thought it kind of tied into the Ouija board thing. He had Ouija board rules, and then this I thought was pretty interesting. This mysterious box allegedly from Aleister Crowley's house is opened. I didn't know there was a mysterious box in the first place exactly that's why i put this in here because <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. i didn't either and if you find a mysterious box you want to open it you kind of want to see what's in there right yeah i mean it's just curiosity killed a cat kind of pandora's box kind of thing yeah. so this article basically kind of lays it out there where it talks about okay so there's a museum of creepy people alistair crowley and he deserves his own wing because he's an occultist magician religion founder uh called the great beast and the wickedest man in the world okay and he was also famous enough to make the album cover of the uh, Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Heart Club band. That's just pretty interesting. So he's got his own little, he's famous. Yeah. For being in the occultist, the weirdness, the you know, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of research you can do on Oscar Crowley. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking like Ghost Adventures has gone to his Oscar Crowley place and all that. So he, he's, he's it. Yeah. He's like modern day sort of, uh, well, he's dead, but I mean, you know, it, he he brought this to a light and made things popular due to his notoriety. Yeah. I mean, it, it became an acknowledged subculture. Yeah. So. So, okay, so they found this box, and this was buried at the Bolskine House, mm-hmm. right, which is the stately manor on the southeast side of Loch Ness, which was ground zero for many of Crowley's alleged experiments in black magic. And performances of strange rituals. Oh, the house burned in 2015? Yeah. Oh. The current owner of the sealed box decided it was time to open it and reveal the contents because, you know, Crowley's house burnt down. They have the box. You know, and this guy's a collector. He collects oddities. Yeah. He said, I collect oddities of the strange and weird, and I have studied the paranormal for most of my life, but not so much witchcraft. And the more I find out, the more it points me, 
points to being real. Oh. And there's a picture on the website where it shows Aleister Crowley. You can kind of look at him, right? Yeah. So would Aleister Crowley reveal his secrets up front or make you wait until the grand finale? It says on October 2nd, 2020, the Ivor and his carrier revealed that the local resident, Rick Spencer, bought a mysterious box on eBay um, that the seller claimed was found underneath the floorboards of the smoldering remains of the Bullskeen house. Yeah. In 20, you know, because 2015, like you said, it burned down. So Spencer says that he was intrigued by the box, which was covered in and sealed in melted wax, had a hexagram and intricate carvings on the lid and the initials AC. Okay. And the unknown, unknown seller, or I'm sorry, unnamed seller, said, basically claimed that he acquired it from someone who was assessing the fire damage at the Bullskeen house. And basically, you know. Found it. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, hey, it's found underneath the floorboards. It has AC on it. The whole place was actually owned by Alistair Crowley at one time, so it's got to be his box. Hmm. And there's a quote that says, The hexagram is interesting as this links to Alistair Crowley and the Golden Order. I'm not saying it is Alistair Crowley's, but it may be homage or homage of yeah. some sort. And so after an unsuccessful appeal to the public for any additional information on strange might be Crowley's box, Spencer decided to open a box himself, but not before taking the precaution of surrounding it with a circle of salt. <laughs> so this guy, he's like, you know what? Let me break out the uh, <laughs> the uh, Morton salt here. I'm going to put a circle around it. Okay. So you can bind whatever's in this box. Yeah. And Spencer admitted that he was still shaky as he broke the seal, lifted the lid, and discovered the box contained a doll, coins, vegetation, and an illustration, which he said seemed familiar. Okay. Yeah. And there's basically, you can click on a link to, to see, right? Yeah. So when you click on it and see it, and you wait for it to load up with your amazing internet, it, it doesn't really look like much. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. But if you go to the Iverness-Courier.co.uk, there's a picture of the box. Kind of a plain looking box. Oh, there's a half penny. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, it's a burlap poppet. Yep. A weird drawing that seems oddly familiar, like they were saying in the article. Yeah. It looks like a destroyed rose pet. Actually, that's not even a rose. I'd say that's like a tea rose. Yeah. Something. And, yeah. And that's pretty much it. So basically a voodoo doll, some coins, dried flower, an effigy picture of whatever it is. And something written on that drawing. Yeah. Is that Hebrew? I think it's a divot box. It looks like a divot box. And here's the thing. For a while there, I want to say about two years ago, two years past a year ago, eBay was plagued with these self-made. Yeah, divot boxes. Divot boxes. Is this just another one of those? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Mr. Spencer realized that the image that he'd seen that he thought was familiar is some very similar to the one in the film Sinister, which was released <sighs> in 2012, which meant that it really didn't have any connection to Crowley at all. And he said that he had heard from ex experts on the subject that they told him, you know, hey, uh, it was a Dybbuk box and the contents could have been a witch's binding spell. And he added, it would be something because people are saying it had been done properly. Hmm. Hmm. So the experts, experts, uh, they said, "Yep, looks like it's a legit Dybbuk box." But you know, it's got the the sinister yeah. thing, and it kind of I think goes to what you were saying that you know there was a whole flood of these fake Dybbuk boxes that kind of came on the market. And I think this guy, because I saw his picture on the Inver Inverness um, page, yeah. I, he's familiar, and that's because I could have sworn I've seen some YouTube videos of him opening these haunted boxes. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know if that's him or the other guy you're thinking of. Yeah, because there's a couple of them though. Yeah. And now this guy Spencer, he hasn't given up hope. He's asking the public for information on the almost as mysterious as Crowley himself, owner of the house from 2012 to 2015, the secretive Dutch millionaires Trudy Piker. Ba Baker? Baker? Yeah, Baker. Baker, who had a warning after finding out looters had stolen items from the smoldering moraine, moraine, uh, remains. <laughs> yeah. 
I am very disappointed, I must say, by the people who, after the fire, went to Bolskin and took out lots of valuables, which were stored in the room which is still standing. They broke in and took everything, all the furniture was, which was left. Um, because of Bolskin's reputation, I really think, really do think that people stealing things from Bolskin will be punished. You can't steal things from Bolskin, and if you do, you will be punished. I've had the house for a long time, and I'm not going to talk about what can happen in the house, but I'm sure the house is protecting itself. I don't know about them coming to a sticky end, but they won't be happy about it. Yeah, so whether it's real or not, she's saying if you mess with the house, the house is going to get you. Fun fact, I believe Led Zeppelin either recorded or stayed there at the Bolskine house. Uh, Jimmy Page, I think, did. Yeah? Yeah, because he was a big sort of follower of Aleister Crowley. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, each band member had their own little symbol, and his was Zoso. Oh. From Aleister Crowley, and it influenced. So, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting, man. I'm like, oh, sweet. Yeah. Let's find out what it is. And they started to describe it, and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a Dybbuk box. And then when they had this picture of the what looks to be, you know, the sinister, like, boogeyman from that movie – and there, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. 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 You can tell because. No, I mean, it's possible papers. that maybe the box or something like that may be kind of related to Aleister Crowley in some way, but. The paper is you know. so new looking, too. I mean, you're not fooling nobody. Well, it's been sealed with wax <laughs> and stored in a place, so maybe it is. I don't know. <sighs> but yeah, there you go. That was pretty interesting, but didn't turn out to be much to do about nothing so far. But, you know, I kind of thought it went with a sort of a Ouija board theme. Yeah. So I think we're going to do at this point is we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. And you've been listening to the Creepy Geeks podcast. Yeah. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. Okay, we're back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Ouija board was kind of interesting. The mysterious box, I was thinking it was going to be super interesting. Didn't really turn out to be interesting. You know how else is not really that interesting to me right now? What? Tom DeLong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have the Through the Star or To the Stars Academy, Tom DeLong, and sort of this, this whole thing where Blink 182 frontman Tom DeLong got out there. Mm-hmm. And it's brought some attention and you have all these UFO videos and stuff like that. And over the, what the past year we've been talking about disclosure and things like that in the Pentagon footage and all this crazy stuff about UFOs and the possibility that they're real and yeah. the possibility that the government has known about it for a long time. And with all these articles that came out, it seems like a lot of Kobe, guess what? We have indisputable evidence, but then you get the articles that get rolled back by the publisher saying, Oh, we misquoted. Like Harry Reid, who said that UFO vehicles exist or off-world vehicles, you know. So it's kind of like give and take, right? So anyway, these guys raised a couple $2.2 million to fund the Two of the Stars Academy. Yeah. So they can keep investigating. Well, I came across, again, on Mysterious Universe, where it says Tom DeLong and, and this whole, you know, TTSA got caught posting an apparently debunked UFO video. Oh, man. Yeah, and so when I did a quick search for this, I came across another article that basically said Tom DeLong Group stunningly debunked curtains for partial disclosure. That's that's a pretty drastic headline. Yeah. But, so um, here's the thing, though. Yeah. The first article is from 2020. The second one is from 2018. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like, wow, that's that's a two-year gap. So what's going on here, right? Yeah. So I don't know. So I, I clicked on it so I could kind of see what's going on here, and it comes back basically saying that um, on November 8th, DeLong posted a short video on Instagram and Twitter showing what appears to be an elongated UFO hovering over a field in Seattle. Okay. With a caption, looks like secret machines at TTSA Academy. Oh, gosh. Yeah, or I'm sorry, TTS Academy. Oh, and secret is spelled wrong. Yeah. Secret Machines is the title of a series of sci-fi novels based on actual events uh, co-authored by DeLong and a planned series of nonfiction books. 
published by the To the Stars Media. Okay. And this generated a series of immediate responses from, uh, I'm sorry, by Scott Brando of UFOinterest.org, who pointed out that the video was posted by MUFON case number 112147. Mm-hmm. So that's 112147. On November 6, 2020, as a sighting in Camden, New Jersey. He then exposed it as a video posted in 2012 as an alien UFO sightings over Seattle, Washington that was debunked by oh. being CGI. I remember this one. Yep. And of course, this is from Mysterious Universe, Universe, Mysterious Universe, right? Dot com. And again, it was Paul Seaburn who basically says, hey. Yeah. So I read it. I'm like, whoa, okay. That's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. So Tom DeLonge's being exposed for sharing fake UFO videos, and he says it doesn't appear DeLonge knew it was a hoax, but spread it intentionally. So he didn't know it was a hoax, but he spread it because he's like, man, I got UFO footage. I'm going to put it out there. I got to make this viral. Well, I mean, of course, you know, if that's your thing and, you know, hey, if we came across footage, we'd stick it out there probably. You know, it kind of depends on what kind of footage it was. If it was like, you know, a straight up UFO thing, like, yeah, what is that? But if we knew it was military craft, probably secret, probably wouldn't necessarily put that out at least for a while. Yeah. You know, long enough to get it all backed up in multiple places and saved and stuff like that. So it won't be like. And also you know. to see if anybody else reports. Yeah, because, I mean, you kind of like don't go flying. But anyway, so it shows how easily one can be fooled. Mm-hmm. And people obviously expect more <laughs> from TTSA, right? And the long. Because, you know, hey, they revealed the Nimitz Tic Tac UFO videos. Yeah. And he kind of points out, he's like, does this cast along or does this basically cast DeLong's other revelations or rev, why can't I talk today? Revel how do you say that? Revelations. Revelations into doubt. I mean it I just it, yeah it does because it's like okay so all right in this particular instance he may not know that this is a hoax but it's obviously not real. Yeah. It was that terrible terrible CGI which basically you know gets a lot of people. Yeah. But it got spread. So it's out there. It did get taken down pretty quickly. By him. Yeah. Or by TTSA. Yeah. So if it hadn't been for Scott Brando at ufointerest.org and the express.co, basically CEO, then you would have never known about the hoax. So anybody would have been looking at him and been like, look, look. Oh, they've got more evidence. Yep. Look, that's real. Yeah. And these guys used, you know, their evidence and stuff like that to gain money to be able to go through and fund their academy and all that other stuff to keep going forward with disclosure. So it's kind of like. Mm. But see, he's also been backpedaling for the past year. Well, he did, you know, like, okay, before he posted a thing where he thought it was something kind of weird thing in the sky, wanted to be like a satellite or a rocket launch or something like that. Yeah. So he had to roll that back. So after I read that, I'm like, okay, so he posted some stuff he thought was real, come to find out it wasn't real, and he pulled it down. Good. You know, and he, he, he kind of alludes to the point that maybe he didn't really know what it was. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe he thought it was real. But then, you know, when you have this sort of thing, it's kind of like, what if he did know it wasn't real? And he did it on purpose just to get some traction and kind of keep the interest up. Mm. So I found the other article that basically comes from 2018, February 9th, 2018. It says, Tom DeLong Group stunningly debunked. And, you know, ask if this is curtains for partial disclosure. Okay. And it says that the, the Nimitz UFO photo is a party balloon. And that party balloon was taken in Manchester, UK in 2005 by a person named Steve Mira. And if you look at the picture, <laughs> you're like, what the heck is that? Some kind of weird, elongated metallic craft. And really, it's a, it's, it's a balloon, it's, a my dollar looking balloon in the shape of the number one. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> It looks weird. It does look weird. (laughs) So it says Tom DeLonge, CIA, and other Intel advisors used a picture of a Mylar party balloon from 2005 as if it was a genuine UFO and raised over $2.2 million in funding from the event featuring it. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, There was widespread suspicion of this mainstream media sanctioned disclosure in the UFO community, and it was uh, just proven correct. So someone within the group obviously knew it was a fake image. And they, and here's what they say again. They, you know, we do not feel that Tom DeLong was in, was in on it. And his silence suggests he must be very upset at this point. Okay. Yeah. 
and the members of the group completely ghosted the UFO community at large, hardly granting any access whatsoever to the people in front of the front lines that are discovering or doing the disclosure movement. But weirdest of all, it was how uh, anyone, how little anyone in the public was affected by it. UFOs, been there, done that kind of a thing. And it says basically yeah. what real disclosure look, will look like now that the credibility of this operation has been shattered. It's going to be grassroots all the way. In 2019... Disclosure, right? Yeah. Or not disclosure, but release information, that kind of thing. There's, you know, the government says, you know, hey, if you see an unidentified aerial phenomenon, you can do this steps and put in place. And so even in the 2020. Yeah. So, and, you know, this website basically is divinecosmos.com where they talk about it and you can read it if you want. Yeah, but one of the things that they say is we cover Tom DeLong disclosure, including the events of October 11th and December 16th, 2017, in six different articles. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So they're talking about how, if you go further into this article, where they continue to basically debunk a lot of stuff that's been brought to light by TTSA, uh, there's a section here that talks about Jimmy Church. Yep. And how he posted he outed the scandal on his Facebook page on February 7th. Yep. And that 2018, that's the same time he started having a lot of troubles with his social media. Yep. Cause I remember like not even a month after that, he had posted like all the problems he was having with like, you know, YouTube and Facebook and stuff like that. Yep. If I remember correctly, YouTube was hitting him with copyright for using his own copyright stuff. Like, yeah. Dinging him for copyright, but he was using his own content. Which is... Because what, what, he, what he would do is he would take the radio show and he would basically record it while he was doing the radio show and it became a video and he would put that video up on, on YouTube. Yeah. So he it's in two different medias, right? So he's got radio out there and he's got his video on YouTube and they were hitting him for... Almost like double dipping or something. I don't know. It was something weird, but, but it didn't make sense. Yeah, but. and it, it didn't make sense because other entities do that all the time. Absolutely. And it kind of felt a little directed. Now, if this is, if this happened along that same same time period, it makes me wonder about again. Let's strap our tinfoil on a little tighter. Influence in social media. Yep. And the amount of influence certain entities have in social media it seems like anybody who either goes against the grain or has a different opinion, whatever that may be, uh, starts to have trouble. Yeah. So now one part of the article that I do want to say is that in here it reads, I wanted to give DeLong the benefit of the doubt and still do. Yeah. I have felt that he may be in over his head on all this along. In other words, and, and that makes sense because he is the front man for this thing. He's not necessarily the brains behind it all, but he's definitely the front man. He's the star because yeah. he is Tom DeLonge, Blink-182, big band, big popular. Uh, I think they're coming back or I don't know. But anyway, a lot of people know Blink-182. So he, he may be it. And if that be the case, they'd let him run out there and do this a couple different times. He's been burned a couple different times. So I don't know. It's like he, he's the organization's media darling. Yeah, he's their star mouth. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. And and I feel bad because it's like he's he truly believes. Oh, he does. You know? But this is the third time. I know. That first time was in 2017 with this, you know, Mylar number one balloon. And then the second time was when he seen like a rocket launch or something like that. Missile test, I think it was. And then here's the third one. Yeah. That's three. 2017, 2018, and then 2020. Yeah, so it's like, does that mean three strikes, he's out? No, he's put way too much money into this. Are they going to start using a different media darling? No. Okay. Or brand ambassador? (laughs) I think this is kind of like they're using... I think the intent behind using the footage is kind of like the same intent that the public broadcasting... Um, stations do. Oh. Like, do you like this content? We do too. But it's going to go away forever if we don't get donations. <laughs> you know, it's so drumming up them donations, man. Got to keep the, the coffers full so they can continue the, the good fight, right? Yeah, but just like with 
a lot of things that I mean, are come out on there. now. We've seen it too, where magically things happen before con before festivals and conferences. To oh wow, yeah, maybe that's what this is. But kind of because this happens, especially with consumers and and people who take in media or entertainment and things like that. People forget, you know, it's not just like on a television show. It's not just the actor. There's the actor, there's a whole film crew, there's a production crew. So just like, it's not just Tom DeLong. there's an organization and all that behind it. People often forget that. So if this, if the head or the figurehead keeps getting caught up in these scandals or false incidents, people are going to pin it on Tom, not necessarily on TTSA. Yeah, there you go. That's a perfect place to be, right? <sighs> No. Just be in the background. So yeah. if stuff implodes, you just walk off and go yeah. do your own thing. And that's that's not fair to him. Well, no, it's so. not fair to him, but also that's the role he's chosen. True. And he put his money where his mouth is. I mean, you know. So, I don't know. I thought that was kind of weird. It's like, all right, this is the third time. Kind of what's going on here. And, you know, do I think that through the, to the Stars Academy, uh, everything from those guys, grain of salt. Yeah. Like, we still don't have disclosure yet. I don't believe that everything that we've seen or allegedly seen on TV and in the media and stuff is, is necessarily on the up and up. Mm-hmm. Because if they can use this footage, then they can also recreate things like the slideshows that allegedly were, you know, being shown, showing all this stuff. Yeah. You know, things that, like, weren't labeled properly. It's just at all... it. it the credibility of the evidence that you have gets sort of tarnished with this whole thing and maybe loses its credibility yeah. when it's not real. And maybe And that's, proven to be real. What if that's the grand scheme is just to keep discrediting? What if that's the, the, the project blue book of the whole thing is to discredit everything? Yeah. Well, and then it, I mean... It, then everything can go back into the shadows, back into... Now, some people would say, yep, that's exactly what it is. And yeah. other people would say, I don't think the government's that smart. Yeah. I think the government is smart with a lot of things and in, important things, but like if you were running the show here and they were doing it to themselves, you'd just step back. I would. I'm like, no, leave them alone. <laughs> They're going to go ahead and discredit themselves anyway and takes the heat off of us. Yeah. So. Um, but definitely click up or check out um, in our show notes that second link from uh, Divine Cosmos and take a look at that, that Mylar balloon. Because yeah. uh, it's very amusing. Yes. So, yeah. So speaking of amusing, SpaceX has put four astronauts back in space. Yes. And, you know, the, the thing is we missed it. I know. I'm sorry. Well, they rescheduled it, right, because it was because of bad weathers. And I wasn't sure when it was going to happen. And then on our way back from the wonderful place uh, called Michael's Arts and Crafts, <laughs> Evidently, they launched, you know, and, and all day long, I've been, I've been trying to figure out, like, I was forgetting something. I'm like, man, what am I forgetting? And that was it. Yeah. So, okay, if you don't know, SpaceX put four astronauts back into outer space again, and this basically is marking the kickoff of what NASA hopes will be years of the company helping to keep the International Space Station fully staffed. Cool. So, you kind of have private business space company, you know, and NASA is... The na- okay, so NASA is like has subcontracted SpaceX to to give them rides and stuff. Yeah, which I guess that's the way it's going to have to be since evidently NASA doesn't have any money. Poor things. Well, I mean, do they? Because it, it, I mean, it, you, there's a rabbit hole you can run down with all this stuff. But so anyway, regardless of whatever we got, Americans going back into space, international sp- space guys going back into space. <laughs> Sochi Noguchi, an astronaut with Japan Space Agency. Well, he's one of them. So here's who you have. You've got Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Sochi Noguchi, right? Yeah. And this international sort of crew here going back into space to go to the International Space Station, taking a ride on the SpaceX craft. Yeah. That's something that we weren't able to do. You know, it was, I believe it was in August, you had Doug and Bob went up. Yeah. And then the spacecraft that they're talking about here, actually, the I think it's the Dragon SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule, got certified by NASA just like a month ago to be able to do exactly that, and then they put four people in the orbit. Yay! That's which I, means that there's not the, the need to travel to Russia and launch. 
from Russia and this, these old space capsules is not there anymore. We can do it here. Yeah. Good. Exactly. So, yeah. I'm just now, happy. here's the deal. The trip would have been shorter for these guys if they were able to launch on Saturday, but weather took them, you know, kind of took them out of the equation for doing a space launch. Yeah. Because it said that basically the ISS or International Space Station would have lined up in such a way as to allow the spacecraft to reach the space station in about eight hours. But since bad weather came into play, they're going to launch. They took off Sunday evening, and that just puts the amount of time it can rendezvous with the ISS to a, a longer than eight-hour period, right? Mm-hmm. But here's where I kind of thought it was pretty interesting. Aside from the fact that they were, we're, we're launching people into space kind of on our own dime sort of thing, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. The capsule has a working restroom, and the astronauts will have time to get some sleep as the fully autonomous vehicle maneuvers through orbit while SpaceX and NASA officials in Houston um, and Hawthorne, California, watch over the journey. Cool. So they get to hang out. And if they got to pee, no problem. There's a bathroom. That's very convenient. Yep. So how it works, I don't know. But, you know, the it's a landmark for NASA and the company, which is SpaceX, because it's the first fully operational crewed mission for SpaceX. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, was it August or it was May? It wasn't August. It was May that basically Doug and Bob. Was it? Yeah. So it says, but this mission is not a test. The SpaceX Crew Dragon was officially certified as a spacecraft worthy of carrying people last week. And it paves the way to begin taking and making the trip relatively routine. Oh, they came back in August. That's what it was. They came yeah. back in August, yeah. So, so on this particular mission, uh, both Walker and Noguchi have backgrounds in physics, and the Crew-1 team is slated to conduct all sorts of experiments during their six-month stay on the ISS. Oh, wow. Uh, including research into how microgravity affects human heart tissue. Yeah. And they're going to attempt to grow radishes. In space. Down on Fraggle Rock. Yeah. <laughs> That's... Well, no, because the, the dozers and <sighs> the fraggles, they grew radishes. Not they in were space, so, they didn't. They it's... were so nutritious. Nope. And space food needs to be nutritious. Okay. So, yeah. Well, the mission had been called into question briefly because evidently SpaceX CEO Elon Musk revealed on Twitter that he was experiencing symptoms it was being tested for COVID-19. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So uh, NASA did a contact tracing effort to ensure that no essential personnel for the launch might have been exposed. Yeah. So officials said that the effort was completed by Friday night and they had no cause for concern. And Musk, Elon Musk said uh, on Saturday that he most likely had a moderate case of COVID. This is how Iron Man starts in real life. What? No, I'm just. What if he's sick? Who? Elon. I I don't think he is. Okay. He just had a moderate case of COVID. <laughs> what if he was just joking around? It's like, I don't feel good. I'm to have a moderate case of COVID. And they're like, no, you just got seasonal allergies, bro. Okay. Oh, you get a summer cold? <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are the worst, right? So, yeah, it's been like over a decade. So we didn't have the ability to launch astronauts into space. Because when the space shuttle program retired in 2011, that was it. And NASA had to rely on Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Hmm. Now we don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool, man. So, um, yeah. And because of that, the space agency says that the multi-billion dollar orbiting laboratory was understaffed. So in 2009, for example, there was as many as 13 astronauts on board at one time. Wow. Yeah, because when you have a space shuttle, it can pick up like seven or eight dudes and carry them out there. You know, but once that stops, they're, you know, they're going back to the Soyuz craft, which only holds four, I think, at the most. Yeah. It's small. Then you're up to, you're waiting on Russia. So how many people are up there right now? I don't know. Huh. A lot. Six. Well, okay, if you don't count the four that ain't there, I think it's four or five, three. I don't know. But honestly, I have no idea how many people are up there right now. Because whatever it is. I think if you take Bob and Doug out of the equation, they're down a couple. I don't think that they leave it fully. I don't think they leave it down to one person. Oh my you know? gosh, that would be that would be kind of terrible. Okay, like if you search how many people are on the space station, ISS, um, like that's the exact term for Google. Google 
immediately pops up six people. An international crew of six people live and work while traveling at a speed of five miles per second, orbiting Earth about every 90 minutes. Huh. Well, very nice. Yeah. So anyway, the space people, they're in orbit right now, riding around that SpaceX Crew, Drag, crew, uh, crew Dragon module, and they're going to basically rendezvous with the ISS on Monday at 11 p.m. Eastern. So probably by the time you've heard this podcast, it's already happened. Yeah. So here's the scoop. By being delayed, instead of an eight-hour ride to get up to the ISS, it's become a 27-hour ride in that oh. little co- capsule. Because of Wow, that's because of weather. awful. That's terrible, man. Can you imagine being trapped? No. I'm trying to think of something that I can relate to how big that thing is. Basically, it's like getting in the uh, old family station wagon and being in that thing for 27 hours. <laughs> you know, somebody's going to get sick from drinking orange juice. Somebody's going to have to pee in a bottle. It's going to be it's going to be great. So, yeah. Yep. Anyway, I thought that was kind of cool, though, because, you know, hey, back in space, the Crew crew Dragon capsule is basically been certified. You know, they can start doing more and more regular missions and get the supplies they need to keep this thing up and running. It's, you know, it's it's a good time, man. It's good for everybody. Yeah. And we'll see what kind of happens. And if, it, and if Starlink keeps launching these little satellite modules, maybe we'll have some good internet. Good times. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was kind of funny in a good way. Like, eh, sweet. Because especially when I read it was like 27 hours, like, you got to be kidding me. I couldn't even, you know, it'd be terrible. But it's okay. <laughs> um, here's something we didn't really talk about. So Rick Moranis was assaulted a while ago. Oh, no. Like, just randomly just beat up. You know, Rick Moranis, right? Ghostbuster, unofficial Ghostbuster, I think. I don't yeah. know if he became an official Ghostbuster after his uh, soiree in the second movie or not. But anyway... Yeah, you know, Rick, Rick Rick Moranis is a nice guy. Never, from what you hear, he doesn't never really cause any problems. You know, he's not known for being anything but a nice guy. Yeah. Um, but when he was in New York, right, the article was basically that you know he was randomly attacked in New York, just assaulted. Poor thing. Like, dude, just ran up and like punched him, like all crazy. Just walked over and just just punched him for some reason. Probably a you know who knows. You know, somebody obviously having problems. Well, they arrested the dude. Good. So a man arrested in random attack on Ghostbuster star Rick Moranis. So the subject, sub, basically this guy was accused of assaulting Rick Moranis. He's been arrested now. Um, the New York Police Department says that uh, Marque, Marquez Ventura, 35, was taken into custody Saturday afternoon by being spotted by a New York Police Department transit officer. And it wasn't clear uh, clear if Ventura, who identified, uh, who basically he's homeless, right? So... It wasn't clear if Ventura, who was identified as being homeless, had an attorney, so he couldn't really comment. So, in other words, they're saying that this was a homeless guy that, you know, basically punched Rick Moranis. And apparently has a history. Of punching people? Yeah. Well, no, actually, we're very lucky because this involves pulling a knife on a couple and beating people up. Um, Yeah. He pulled a knife on a Bronx subway couple, and he brutally beat them up. So my thinking is that if he has some issues, he should probably get them taken care of, and maybe jail might be the place to get some attention. Yeah. So, yeah, because like he he punched the guy wearing, uh, he punched Rick Moranis wearing an, an I Love New York sweatshirt. So, yeah, he knocked uh, Moranis to the ground in an unprovoked attack, and then basically he fled on foot. And so Moranis went to the police department, and uh, what they said was Rick Moranis was assaulted on the Upper West Side, and he's fine but grateful for everyone's thoughts and well wishes, and he suffered from pain, you know, to the head and back and the hip. So I mean, because he got knocked down. I mean, this was a vicious yeah. punch because yeah, yeah, it, and he got I mean he got bowed over, man. I mean, he's like laid him out. Poor guy. Yeah. I'm like, so. I like the the quote from uh, Captain America. He was all like, you know, find this man. Nobody nobody touches Rick Moranis. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. funny thing is that he'd been out of the Hollywood spotlight for a long time by his own choice. He comes back and starts, he does like one mint commercial with Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. 
And then, like, right after that commercial came out, it's like two weeks later or whatever, he gets basically attacked in New York. Yeah. So if there was anything that could have been you know, perceived as a sign as to maybe go back into wherever you were, instead of pulling back out or coming back out into Hollywood, that was probably it. Gosh. And see, and here's a fun fact. If I remember correctly, the reason why Ryan Reynolds knew Rick Moranis enough to, to kind of get him to do this is that in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Rick Moranis was the dad, the scientist dad who shrunk the kids. Mm-hmm. Ryan Reynolds was one of the kids. And they're both Canadian. Oh, well, huh. Did you know that? Well, I know they're both Canadian. Yep. I just didn't realize. Was he one of the kids? I think so. Man, now I got to look that up. Yeah. And, you know, fun fact, uh, Rick Moranis' character name was Wayne Szyzlinski. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, but that's that's awful because I was looking at what he... If he... He's done a lot. Like, you know, if you don't know who he is, Little Shop of Horrors, Spaceballs, Flintstones, Ghostbusters, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and he was also um, part of the Second City television show, SCTV. Hmm. Canada. Canada. Yeah. Well, I'm glad they found the person that, you know, popped him because, it, you know, I don't, I don't think he necessarily deserved that, you know. And if the guy's got problems that are just randomly attacking people, it's probably be dealt with. Yeah. But yeah, I like how they say, you know, the article was like, man arrested in random attack on Ghostbusters star Rick Moranis. So there you go. Yeah. I, what I was going to say was the, this guy, he had the, the homeless man that attacked him. He attacked that couple April 13th. And I guess he must have been released, even though he had been charged. He only got charged with misdemeanor menacing with a weapon, according to the court records. He beat this couple up so bad that the the man's shoulder got dislocated so bad it was hanging down to his belly. So Okay, so menacing is one thing. This was a full-on assault. Yeah. So, mm. and and he broke the woman's jaw and... I'm sorry, man. If this happened to us and they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to charge him with misdemeanor menacing. Yeah. I'd be like, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and sue the crap out of you guys. And then he ended up back out on the streets and he hurt Rick Moranis. I... That's not cool, New York. Yeah. Get a handle on stuff. I mean, if they were worried about, like, the size of your soft drinks for a long time. And now they're just, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, I'm glad Rick Moranis is okay. Yeah. And I'm glad that the person uh, got caught again. So maybe third, fourth, fifth time's the charm. I hope so. Yeah, you because know, if you got some random dude who's homeless who may or may not have problems coming up just randomly attacking people, that's not cool. So anyway, but you know the good part of the story is is that the guy's been found and charged, and we put it in here because you know Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. And there you go. So at this point, I think we're just about done with this particular podcast episode. Episode number 198. Okay. So, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Um, oh, yeah. Y'all, be sure to join our Facebook group, which is Creep Geeks Facebook group. Like us on Facebook. The official page is going to be Creep Geeks Podcast, obviously. Um, we are trying to make the group grow, so check out that group. We do have links in the show notes for this podcast episode. And... Uh, if you want anything else Creep Geeks related, check out the website. That's going to be creepgeeks.com. And I know I'm forgetting something. Yeah, we also have a Patreon page. So you can go and support the podcast that way where you can get behind the scenes stuff, never release stuff, specific stuff for patrons. Oh, yeah. Yep. And uh, we've started to actually update that with like, you know, some different th- I, Okay, so just to kind of give you a little heads up. The other day I thought about something. It's like if I was going to take a trip to Point Pleasant to see... Mothman, where would I go? You would go to the Mothman Museum. Well, we don't know because we've been there. And yeah. we have, you know, pictures and things like that we've took and the experiences that we've had there. But I wanted to go ahead and put some of the pictures that we've taken there so that, you know, hey, maybe you can see and go, you know, that's a cool looking picture. I think we should go there and check it out. Yeah. And at least it kind of give you away or, uh, you know, kind of give you the idea of where you can go take pictures and where you can see stuff from. More than just like a random thing on Google Maps. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and we have a ton, ton of stuff that came from Flatwoods, 
and Mothman and that sort of thing. And we're going to be kind of putting it all out there first, pictures and video, before it actually shows up in the general populace. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, pop on over to Patreon. We have, like, really, really low levels as well. So you can kind of join up if you want yeah. and see kind of what's going on. Anyway, that's about all I got. And then it's going to be uh, patreon.com forward slash creep geeks. Yep. Yep. Cool. All righty. So you ready? Oh, uh, questions, comments, concerns, feedbacks, show ideas, contact at creepgeeks.com. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.